Welcome to the Continued Silence with me, Emma Jane Taylor on UK Health Radio. The Continued Silence is focused on the very uncomfortable conversation of child sex abuse and the importance of talking openly about this subject to try and normalise the conversation. Child sex abuse is real. It affects millions of people, young and old, across the world. The work we do is very much engaging more lateral thought processes on this terrible crime, supporting survivors, protecting children, and of course, helping those not wanting to listen, to listen. Joining me each show is my resident panel, therapist, Denny Corby, activist, Chris Tuck, and my resident poet, Michael Borton. Each week, we are joined by guests from all around the world to um, share more insights uh, on this crippling conversation, helping us to share more important messages. This month, we are joined by guest, Dr. Sophie King-Hill. So without further ado, let's find out uh, a little bit more about Sophie uh, before I come to Denny, who is going to open the show with me on her thoughts uh, on this conversation. So hi, Sophie. Thank you for joining us today. Hello. Hello. You all right? Yeah, it's great to sort of see you again. I know you do some great work around this conversation. So just tell us a little bit about your background, actually, Sophie. Okay, so I work at the Health Services Management as a senior fellow at the University of Birmingham. And much of my research set research centres around uh, children and young people and harmful sexual behaviour and the sexual behaviours of young people, both those that harm and those that have been harmed. So that's the main focus of a lot of the things that I do. I've worked quite extensively looking at sibling sexual abuse and also um, healthy sexual behaviours and and online sexual behaviours in children and young people. I've recently been working with other colleagues at the University of Birmingham and within our medical school uh, to tackle the kind of ingrained issues within the medical profession in terms of sexual abuse, um, misogyny uh, and sexual harassment. Um, so that's a kind of growing field at the moment that I feel is quite it's quite neglected. Mm. Well, it's going to be a big show as always. Thank you very much for joining us today, Sophie. OK, Denny, great to see you there. Thank you for joining us today. So, Denny, you know, this is going to be a really big conversation today. And I'm sure, again, lots of lateral conversations will come from it. But, you know, medical profession, child sex abuse, the link and what we've seen in the news and the articles that we've read is you know, quite quite something, right? Mm, yeah, it's good to be here again, Emma J. Yeah, I mean, the experience of um, child sexual abuse and the impact this can have upon medical procedures, my goodness, it brings a whole deeper level, doesn't it, of anxiety, fear, physical vulnerability, sense of powerlessness, and look, it's an invasion of the body. Um, And if you've been a victim of child sexual abuse, that's no surprise, is it, that when you're in that environment and you're facing all of those external stimuli, that there's a greater chance of initiating post-traumatic stress symptoms, flashbacks, So we all have to go through medical examinations, be it dentists, be it medical examinations forensically after a rape or a sexual assault, all those medical procedures that are about everyday well-being. So for me, child sexual abuse is on a spectrum that ranges, doesn't it, from non-invasive to invasive. And that's absolutely what the medical procedures encompass. So I'm really looking forward to opening up the conversation today around how we can ensure that there's more trauma informed practice, what that means, how we can get that out there within the profession, because as we well know, trust, trust is a major thing. And we go along very readily. We had a conversation just prior to this uh, around how we we are taught from a very young age to trust our doctors and our medical professionals. Um, So yes, looking forward to opening up the conversation and hearing other people's points of view on that. Brilliant. Well, look, Denny, uh, Sophie, um, Denny just picked something up there, which I'd like you to outline and explain. Non-evasive procedures and invasive procedures, just so we can clarify the difference of those. Yeah, I think Sophie's on mute. Okay, I think really when you, you're looking at the, the medical profession, and as Denny said, Denny said, you know, all of these different complexities that surround it and the different types of procedures, you know, you get that there are procedures that are non invasive in terms of how they touch, touch you and what they talk to you about. But then there's also a difference with the invasive procedures and also the protocols that they need to follow. But I think really what's embedded in this is a wider culture that needs exploring. So if there needs to be a culture shift, within um, child sexual abuse, within medical the medical profession, and within these people that are in a position of power, in a position of trust, 
that we're instructed, as Denny said, you know, to trust from a very long, young age. We need to really map this back to where to medical students and the training that they have and the support that they have in terms of reporting. So time and time again, I've seen uh, there's been research and I've seen with the medical students that we've worked with, that if even if things cross their path, they don't know how to report. And that translates then into the medical profession. So if things are being seen, you know, the reporting, the reporting mechanism appears to be a key issue here. And that was highlighted in the recent independent inquiry into child sexual abuse, wasn't it? You know, that people are told that they have to report. However, when you really dig behind that and you look and you, and you look into that in in a lot more depth, a lot of people don't know the mechanisms and how to do this. So this could be happening in, in this context. However, you know, and people want to report it, people want to whistleblow and people want to raise the discussion, albeit being a really difficult discussion to have, um, you know, that they don't know how to do it. Uh, yeah, and that's uh, two things that you picked up, that I picked up there. One of the ones that you, well, actually two, three things. You talked about culture shift uh, and I'd like to explore that conversation. I think you then talked about the medical training and obviously you talked about the reporting mechanisms as well. So if we could just go back, Sophie, to talk about the culture shift, what do you mean when you say culture shift? What kind of, what could, should we all be considering and thinking about with this conversation? I think, I think the kind of the real fundamental point here is the, the behaviour that we don't challenge is the behaviour that we accept, you know, and that needs to be really key. It needs to be really firmly embedded within the medical profession. And I don't think it is at the moment. I think there's a lot of kind of passivity um, in terms of accepting things that go on or seeing things as the norm. So if we make a culture shift is a kind of real fundamental shift in the way that things are viewed and the way that things are handled and the way that things are reported, um, you know, and, and reducing that acceptability of certain behaviours. But these things are really gradual and they have to start at the very foundation. So this is where the information, the education, the support has to be in place for medical students from the first year that they attend university. You know, and this this isn't like a kind of a one off training session. This has to be embedded within the curriculum that they're um, learning. When you say education and information, you're talking about the conversations we should be challenging and the things that we sh we're not challenging. Is that what you mean by that? Yeah, I think there's the conversation. Well, it's twofold. There's the conversations that we should be challenging and the conversations we should be having and the things we should be reporting, but also knowing what's acceptable, acceptable and what isn't. You know, if, if people are complacent, then it's more likely that abusers are going to be more prevalent because of the lack of reporting so there's no deterrent and no consequence so and then, i think it's kind of parallel yes and and sophie just staying with you there the, the, the it, earlier on this year an nh doctor was arrested for child sex assault after examining two girls and i guess this is then again that conversation it's about you know understanding what is acceptable what isn't acceptable in the medical profession and what and your and your checks and everything is that what you mean I think so. There's there's the acceptability of it in terms of checks and everything, but the people that are carrying this out, the perpetrators of the child sexual abuse, are obviously feeling that they're in, a, in an environment where they're not going to be challenged. And I think that's a really key point to think about in terms of position of power, the hierarchy within doctors, consultants, nurses, and the environment that they're in that they feel that they can do that with no consequence. You know, I saw, um, and I can't remember what country it was in, but the guy was arrested. Um, he, the guy, the, the woman was giving birth and she was having a cesarean. Did you see this news article? And um, while um, she'd been um, given uh, the anaesthetics, he gave her, he, he, you know, forced himself onto her orally. Um, and it was someone saw. And you're like, my goodness, that woman was giving birth. I mean, I know it's, it's not child sex abuse. But who in their right mind? <laughs> and how do you how do we start trusting doctors? OK, Chris, let's bring you into this conversation. You know, there's a really big conversation already starting. And of course, there's so many lateral threads to this. But uh, what are your thoughts? So I think there's this almost like godlike complex in the medical hierarchy that 
Dr. Sophie has outlined. And I think that um, some staff members will find it very challenging to challenge this godlike um, reputation of these individuals that have got the power and that may be misogynistic and abusive. I'm not saying everybody is, but there is a culture of this. And I think we should, as individuals and members of the staff, be able to challenge anybody about anything if it's in the interest of the patients um, and protecting the welfare of patients and service users. So I think that cultural shift from that perspective needs to happen um, so that um, all medical professionals, no matter where they are in the hierarchy, they are answerable to the service user. So if the service user wants to ask a question or wants to challenge something, that they are able to do that because the system allows for that to happen because the culture is there to allow for that to happen. Yeah, and I guess that, you know, all of that is um, absolutely essential and um, absolutely what we should be doing. Why aren't we doing it? I mean, just why aren't we doing it already, uh, Chris, Sophie? I mean, why it, why isn't this already out there as, a, as, a, as an important um, consideration and, and factor to this conversation? Well, I think... I think things are starting to change, but very gradually. But I really do agree with what Chris is saying. You know, there's that there's a massive fear of repercussions. So there's a fear of repercussions. So if there's a fear of repercussions for medical staff in terms of reporting people, what position does that then put parents in or um, other patients? And then if you think about it, if if patients and parents and doctors are scared of reporting, what position does that put children in? You know, where is the mechanism for listening to children? I mean, that was that was one of the key findings, wasn't it, of the independent inquiry into child sexual abuse. We've got to listen to young people. We've got to listen to children. And I think this is what needs to come in fairly rapidly is in terms of listening to children. But this isn't a new concept. You know, there was mm. the 1997 Childhood Matters report into child sexual abuse or child abuse that said we need to listen more. And even back as far as 1991, there was an NSPCC report into institutional child sexual abuse that said we have to listen to children but I think in terms of the medical profession and, and kind of reflecting what Chris was saying there is this fear of repercussion there's also an additional layer to the fear within reporting a medic is this kind of survivor guilt if you report somebody with if you're reporting a medic and they get found guilty they get struck off you know they completely lose their medical career and we've seen this quite a lot um when I've been running some sexual violence workshops within our, our medical school at work, you know, there's this real question of if we report, they lose their career. You know, so that, that again, it's kind of it's adding more trauma to the but, victim. But they lose their position from reporting regardless of the outcome. No, there's a fear of uh, so there's a fear of repercussions. So, so being, sorry, but if you're going to report someone for sexually abusing a child, they lose their job before um, being found guilty? I think, I'm, I'm not sure the, um, the GMC guidelines with that. I'm, I'm sure they wouldn't be allowed to practice until they've right. been in an invest investigation, but I don't have the answers for that. Okay. But, but there is a fear of somebody losing their career if somebody reports. Mm. So I but think we... what Dr. Sophie was saying, EJ, sorry if I've heard correctly, was that it, the fear from the person reporting that the person they're reporting might lose their career right in my experience it's more the other way around it's more um that the professional won't get struck off they won't lose anything until more and more people come forward and then there's a case built up against a certain professional who might be um misusing their powers and abusing um, I think it's quite hard for a medic to be struck off, to be honest, because I've heard of so many cases where um, people know about medics, medical people who are abusive and they just get away with it because they are able to talk their way out of it because of the, um, the language and the science and all of that that they use, um, you know, and they justify why they ha have done something to a service user 
And so I think there's a lot of manipulation that goes on for those that are truly abusive to hold on to their jobs because they can explain things away um, because they've got that language and um, they're the esteemed person and the service user, you know, what do they know? Especially if it's a child, we do ignore the child's voice and we shouldn't be doing it. As Dr. Sophie has pointed out, report after report after report says, listen to the children. Why are we not doing that? And actually, let's just go back, Sophie, you were saying 1997 report. Oh, you know, that's like 24 years ago. We put these reports out there. Here we are when that we've gone from the 20th century to the 21st century and we're still having these conversations. For me, it's that that makes my mind boggle. It makes my brain ache, actually, because there's so many good work. There's so much good work being down there with report report after report after report after report after report. Lots of great things coming from it. Like Chris says, I mean, one of the things I've written, I've just written, surely listening to children is the most uh, natural and obvious thing that we should be doing. And why aren't we? OK, look, I'm going to bring Mike into the conversation now. Mike, uh, you sit there as an ally um, hearing all this stuff. I mean, it's a minefield for all of us here at times, I'm sure. But also for you, um, when you're listening to this, what are you thinking? What are your thoughts? <laughs> I think Mike's on mute. Let's just unmute Mike. I've just unmuted. Sorry about that. I think the thing that staggers me is that is that we, we're living now in a world where the trust has completely gone in an environment where traditionally we've trusted. So it almost feels like we've got to go back and change the protocol totally. So if you go to your doctor, the conditions of seeing your doctor have changed. And rather than try and... Um, catch people doing it and deal with them, stop it happening in the first place. And I don't know, I I have no idea how feasible that is, but if a child is seeing a doctor, there must, by default, there must be someone there. And and it's rather than the the thing you said in terms of you were asked if you wanted someone present, there has to be someone present unless there are special conditions. And and then that's noted so that we... We're dealing with the consequences rather than trying to stop it happening. You, there is no trust. I cannot trust you. I want you to do something to help me. So giving you trust is actually a, a, a mistake, a fallacy. And so therefore, this is the way we will do it. And we can look across all sorts of professions and take away uh, the risk to the children. by. Ch- I've just lost Mike there. Um, yeah, sorry. I, I, I'm sorry, but by changing the, the ways that we actually allow that profession, and we're talking about the medical profession, to be with that child. And I think, you know, parents the world over, I don't know, I, I, if you're listening to this conversation, I think we really need to sort of strip back and go back to this, the, the trust. Also, look at those in power. Um, which is what Chris was saying earlier in this conversation. And would you, do you really want to hand your child over um, into a situation where we're having these conversations now? And what are your thoughts? You know, if you're listening now, would you have even thought that you wouldn't trust your GP? You know, maybe when you have been sexually abused, you are, your senses are heightened. You work in the field, Sophie, your senses are heightened. Mike is an ally, works with us here. His senses are heightened. But so many don't want to listen to us having these conversations. Therefore, their senses aren't heightened. So they allow their children to do things, go places, be be involved in things that maybe um, survivors of child sex abuse wouldn't do because of the lessons that they've learned. And those are the conversations we're also trying to change, right? You know, we need to educate children. We need to listen to children. I mean, I can't even believe we're saying that. We should be listening to children. And parents out there who haven't had their lives touched by child sex abuse, let's keep it that way. And stay listening to this conversation and the importance of it. Okay, Denny, I'm going to come to you now. Um, you know, there's lots of things but sort of being my my notepad is alive with words um and conversations, trust, power, culture shift, uh, looking at the reporting, looking at, you know, the medical changing, challenging conversations. I mean you know, all of these things, like I say, we are heightened senses because of it. And we want to get these messages out. Unfortunately, people come to me with the work that I do after the after the horse has bolted. But 
let's not let that horse bolt. Let's stop this sooner and help people listen sooner. So we don't have to keep seeing and hearing of these conversations because they are, as we know, um, life damaging. Yeah, right, Emma Jane. I mean, I've sat here, uh, yeah, my pad's on fire too. And in order for us to listen and hear children, we've got to get out there and widen and broaden the minds of everybody within our society that it's happening. Because unless that's something that they're prepared to cognitively take on board and and consider and, and be aware of, then the child continues to be the child and not heard. And when you're talking about a change in culture, Um, and a shift there's organizational change in culture isn't there and then there's the individual and those two have to go alongside each other and in order to do any shifting within a culture we have to really acknowledge and understand what what factors make it possible for this to exist in the first place and you know just simply acknowledging that that physical isolation in in a private consultation room makes that very act possible Okay, and then none of us have knowledge of our procedures or medical procedures that we're going into. So let's change that. Let's start to really think about what is actually going to happen to me. Let's explore that. Let's have that explained. And we've spoken about it. Everyone said it, that absolute position of trust and authority that's held by the healthcare professional not only silences the child within the room or a survivor in their adult years who is traumatised through going through these medical procedures, what we absolutely know is it's silencing other healthcare workers. You know, the hierarchy is very similar, isn't it, to the police force, to the military, it's consultants are God, (laughs) and oh, woe betide if you cross them. So it's a whole umbrella of acknowledgement, um, responsibility and shifting everybody's thought processes and not that immediate, that must have happened to me because my doctor did it, my consultant said. Mm. Um, yes, it takes a while to shift culture, but it's it for me, it's about organisational shifts and individual shifts within that. The station that makes you feel good. UK Health Radio. The station that makes you feel good. Okay, thank you, Danny. Well, look. Uh, It's time for us to take a very short break. Don't go anywhere. We will be back after this. Okay, welcome back to the continued silence with me, Emma Jane Taylor, my resident panel, Denny Corby, Mike Borton and Chris Tuck. We are speaking today to Dr. Sophie King-Hill about the medical profession and child sex abuse. It's a big conversation um, and we're doing what we can to (laughs) shoehorn a lot into a very short time. Um, Okay, so Sophie, you touched on it earlier on, failure to report child sex abuse. This was something that came out of the ISA, a really important part of the conversation. But I think the difficulties around this, again, are huge. And I think Chris touched on it as well. Reporting um, should be, uh, failure to report should be a crime. But with the conversation, uh, one of the lateral conversations that Chris was saying earlier, you know, this power um, and then this guilt about people losing their job, maybe if you report, it, it, it's it's a really, really like, it seems so obvious. It seems so obvious to us, maybe, but there's a lot of grey areas around that for people. So how do we how do we shift that, Sophie, so that people do feel more confident and comfortable to report um, child sex abuse? Because even though um it should be a crime how easy would it be to to really make this um really make people do this yeah i think there's there's quite a lot of aspects to look at when we consider that question i think first and foremost we've got to look at the whole environment of the medical profession you know and if we've got to if we keep child sexual abuse as the focus but then let's look up from a take a step back and take a wider picture that actually there's um there's quite a lot of sexual harassment going on within the medical profession uh, and this can be students this can be staff this can be patients against staff this can be staff against patients 
this can be consultants against nurses. So already when child sexual abuse is happening within the, a medical environment, it's embedded within the, this wider context. So in terms of what Denny was talking about, an organisational shift, this has got to take place on, on multi multi-dimensional levels really because it's you know this behavior is acceptable on a real incremental level on lots of different from lots of different perspectives and not just against children but then if we if we look at the reporting uh, as you said you know what does it what will it take to change i think you know the discussions have got to be more candid more things like this have got to be happening you know it's it's not easy to talk about let alone report you know, and that's what we've got to think about, reporting something like this. Um, the, the mechanisms have got to be in place, but they've got to be fairly simple. Everybody's got to know about them. And we've got to keep verbalising what is and isn't acceptable. But I think an, an, an additional layer on that as well is that we've got to challenge this perspective of trusting all medics and trusting people in power. And I'm not saying we should... We should, um, you know, there's loads and loads of really trustworthy doctors and GPs and medics out there that I know that are wonderful people. But I think it's this absolute trust in a profession um, that needs to be questioned. And I think that links back to Chrissy's point is that we need to be more proactive about this rather than reactive. So I think it's got to be two pronged. It's like you said, Emma, you know, people come to you after the fact. So how do we trace that back and, and where do we kind of, make that break before the abuse happens. But it, it's you've got to remember this is embedded in an already quite um, problematic system in terms of how sex and sexual harassment and sexual abuse is viewed. Well, you said two of my favourite words there. <laughs> We've got to be proactive, not reactive. Um, and that's not always easy, right? I mean, you know, we can all be very reactive in this, the, everyone in this on this in this room today, right? Because we are all very, um, uh, uh, very um, focused on this conversation, are very emotionally driven by the conversation for our own reasons. So, you know, it is about stepping back. How can we be proactive? I'm kind of shocked, actually, um, to hear, well, I'm not shocked, because would I am I surprised? No, but the sexual harassment within the medical profession you know, if we go back to another article that was shared earlier this year, the sanction against against 150 doctors for sexual misconduct, a tip of the iceberg. Um, and so with you saying what you've just said, having read this article, um, it's worrying. You know, nearly 150 doctors have been disciplined for sexual misconduct in the last five years. A surgeon's call for action on the systemic and cultural problem of sexual assault within healthcare. This was in The Independent. Doctors campaigning for the UK's healthcare services to address widespread problems with sexual harassment and assault in medicine have warned that people do not feel safe. So, you know, again, this is a huge conversation. Um, and if you've got it in the workplace, you know, and sexual harassment, I think um, there's there's a lot of uh, institutions um, that don't realise that actually how they're behaving is sexual harassment. Um, and I think that's a big conversation maybe for another day. Um, what, what, what is sexual harassment? Because I see it time and time again with people, um, people um, in the personal world, people in the professional world. There's a lot of conversation. Sometimes I'm like, hmm, really, you said that? <laughs> uh, that's actually quite offensive. So it's understanding that language and understanding how we can stop that kind of behavior so that it doesn't encourage conversations that lead on to further assaults. Chris. Sorry, I just wanted to come in from the proactive perspective. So I've had quite a few surgeries over the years. I've had two hip replacements, for example. And the way that I personally was proactive and I had to learn how to do this was um, I often got triggered by people grabbing at my, um, you know, the gown that you have to change into, grabbing at the gown and putting on these things where they listen to your heart and monitor all that kind of thing. And it was afterwards that I um, reflected and thought, why was I triggered by that? What was going on? Why did that make me feel so um, <laughs> like it did? Um, so I from that point onwards, whenever I had a further procedure, I would go, right, please make sure you don't do that. So don't pull up my gown. Ask me permission. 
tell me what's going on and then my brain can deal with it. But if I just see a hand coming across and lunging at me, that's going to trigger me. You need to ask me permission so that I remain and feel empowered in a, a situation where I feel very disempowered because I've got not got my clothes on, for example, I've got that hospital gown on. So I would suggest to anybody listening to this that maybe look at what does trigger you if you do have to have medical interventions of any kind, whatever that happens to be, and state to the medical professional in front of you, what is it that you need to feel safe and remain empowered so that you don't go down that route of feeling very triggered, very disempowered and completely out of out of control of yourself. I think that's great. And actually, there's a few things um, from, from all of you today. Acceptable language. Acceptable language. I think it, we need, maybe professions need a booklet on that. Institutions need a booklet on that. Um, I love the idea of patient, um, even just a, <laughs> a few words, what's going to happen to me today? And I love um, the consideration and permission. So, you know, those these things, those three things for me have jumped out um, from both sides, really, how we can manage this conversation better. Mike, OK, I'm going to come to you next. And um, you, obviously you write a poem for this conversation. But, you know, having sort of sat there listening to this for the last sort of half an hour or so, what are your thoughts again? Um, I, I, I kind of want to add some positive to this as well. The very fact we're seeing lots of news reporting now about people brought to justice, about this report and that report, the very fact we're having this programme, the very fact that I feel proud to be an ally of, of this whole process, this thing, is part of the change that is coming. Now, you go back 20 years, this just wouldn't have happened. It wouldn't be there, but things would be hushed up. So that it is gradual. And every word that's coming from Denny and Chris and Sophie and you is having an impact. And slowly but surely, we will get there. There will be hiccups along the way, but we have to keep going. So I do feel kind of a little bit of positivity about it, which is difficult, but I think it's hopeful. So it's all about hope. I think, you know, and I think, sorry, I think we we have to, you know, whether it's the 1997 report or the 2022 report, we have to take all of that as positives because they are positives on a conversation that we all feel very strongly about. Um, but it's actioning that, isn't it? You know, will it happen in our lifetime? I'd like to think there'll be a shift in our lifetime. Um, God, you know, God willing, we have a good long life ahead of us. We want to see that change so the next generations can be the change that is needed and then so on, you know, but it's I don't know about you guys. It is such a positive space um, with so much great stuff doing. But at times it gets frustrating. It's frustrating. It doesn't happen sooner. And that's uh, why we're all here doing this today. OK, Mike, yeah, let's hear your poem. Because last I, month I did it for you, and I'm not sure I did it justice. No, I'm, I know you did. I know you did. <laughs> but I'm still here. I, I'm an ally. That's my role. So I am your ally. You may not think you need me. And if you don't, that's fine. But whatever, I'll be here for you, for you at any time. I'm really good at listening. No opinions from me to you. I understand the hurt you've had. No, honestly, I do. I can see it deep within your eyes. I can hear it in your voice. And even if you whisper, listen harder, that's my choice. And if you start to falter, I'll catch you if you fall. Stand in the way of challenges, help you stand up tall. We all need people by our side. I'm right here next to you. Your ally, friend, and listener, now let's see what you can do. I'm right here. Yeah. UK Health Radio, the station that makes you feel good. UK Health Radio, the station that makes you feel good.
always so wonderful and it's always so for me very is a lot of depth right because you are putting yourself into this conversation with us um and learning a lot and I'm sure at times you probably <laughs> go away thinking gosh you know scratching your head that this conversation even still exists today um whereas you know we live in this space uh 24/7 I'm honoured to be listening to all of you, all four of you today, to be included in this as an ally. I can't comment on some of the horrific things that have happened. All I can do is say, I am listening and I will be a voice for you. Uh, that's educated or uneducated. It's what we had to do to convince people out there that we do that. And Sophie, yes, I say, I know you're an ally as well. Absolutely. And a very clever one because you're a doctor, so yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Sophie, uh, one of your key messages, and I want to touch on this now, there needs to be a joined up approach from the government to tackle harmful sexual behaviours and sexual abuse. Resources are needed to create a whole family approach for those that experience sibling sexual abuse. More resources, training and support is required to create safe spaces in schools uh, for CYP to explore all matters of sexual behaviours, relationships and sexual health. It is key to listen to the voices of young people to tackle issues around sexual behaviours, sexual harassment and abuse. More training and research is required to support frontline professionals, which will enhance confidence when dealing with these matters. So really, really valid key points there. Let's go back to the first one. Uh, I bang my head against a brick wall with the government. Um, you know, I see petition after petition after petition. I've had my own petitions out there. I've been uh, speaking to various uh, political bodies about it. Um, it's like it's like they don't want to um, believe this exists when they clearly know it does exist, but it's not top of the list and it's not top of their agendas. And the trouble is, because it's not top of their list and top of their agendas, the leadership doesn't even um, in, acknowledge the importance of the conversation. So it doesn't uh, filter down into any corner of society. Um, and because it's not doing that, joining up is going to be a very difficult thing. But it really should be an important thing because uh, we're, we're sat here, we've got 150 doctors <laughs> being you know, challenged for uh, misconduct. We're talking about sexual harassment. We're talking about GPs being arrested. Why isn't it a more um, collaborative approach from the government to the medical profession? It just, there's such a divide there. Sophie. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. I think uh, I think you're absolutely right. I think you know you can. Uh, sometimes I, I get that feeling, you know, that you're swimming against the tide. Sometimes you know what needs to be done, and it doesn't get done. And I think at the moment now that we're living in in the times that we do, in terms of austerity and um, you know cuts and cuts and cuts, you know, from, from the government, the first things to go are th these types of services, these types of support. But I think you know. We have to, as Mike said, you know, we've got to keep doing what we're doing. We've got to keep raising this profile. And there's some really key work going on in this area. Um, and, you know, and listen to the children's voices. It's, it's all, it's, there's some really good models of good practice going on in terms of um, child sexual abuse, how to be proactive, how to be reactive adequately. Um, and that needs to be mapped out further. But also it's complex because there are so many different agencies involved. A lot of the serious case reviews, a lot that has come out of that is lack of communication. You know, some of the things that where, where agencies have fell down is because things haven't been communicated. So communi communication for me has to be more streamlined. That's not a big ask, but the push has to come from the top. It has to come from the government. Another thing in terms of something that I'm really passionate about is, is youth voice and the children's voices so you know I think it's something we've got to really think about in terms of being proactive in child sexual abuse um, within the medical profession is you know when uh, Chris was saying you know she tells people um, she gives her informed consent for everything that happens well as advocates of children so parents carers whoever the responsible adult is for them you know needs to be the platform for that child you know we can't expect a child I'll just stand up to a consultant, a 10-year-old child, and say, don't, don't come with me there, don't do this, you know, because they're not going to be able to verbalise that in most cases. So we have to provide that platform for them. We as adults have an obligation to do that. Um, and I think that's what, what we've got to look at as well. How are we managing the child's voice and how are we telling them that they've got a voice? Because at the moment, 
you know, I mean, the, the old adage, children should be seen and not heard. You don't get that very often anymore. However, no. there's still Social power media. structures within schools, you know, where children have to obey, they have to listen, they have to listen to the adult, exactly the same within the medical profession. So we've got to really think about how we translate what the child is saying and we give them that platform. We must amplify their voice. You know, that's our responsibility. So... um here's a conversation Denny I'm going to bring you in now um it it, it was landed on my desk last week and I and I made I'm not sure why I wasn't aware of it but 14 year old children are now um able to access their documents their medical documents and visit doctors on their own um and have privacy in doing so um now look I think for me this is so uh double-edged um You've got children who need a voice, who need to go and see a doctor. Maybe they are experiencing abuse at home and um, they need that safe space to confidently speak about it. So I do appreciate that strand of this conversation. But you've also got children who feel that they want to be grown up um, and they want to be able to do they may maybe they don't have any issues at home. Right. Maybe they don't have, they just want to be grown up, but they're not um, developed enough to be able to be confident in a space without an adult. They think they are. But when you get to the reality of that situation in a space with a GP or who we're, whoever we're talking about here in the medical profession, who is a paedophile and, um, uh, and puts that child into a compromising situation, then that child, have they got a voice? And I think this is where it's so double-edged for me. Sophie Denny, I think if you could join in on this conversation. Um, Yes, it's a great space for those children that need it who might be struggling with um, difficulties at home, but you've also got children who might not have those difficulties but end up coming away with more difficulties because they haven't been able to be um, uh, what they needed to be in a very difficult situation. I think um, I worked for years in sexual health and it was fundamentally important that young people could attend appointments alone without parents, other, you know, to look after their sexual health. However, we would have a chaperone system um, when they were seeing one of the medics, one of the clinicians. But it's, I agree with what you're saying, it's a double-edged sword. So therefore, it's up to the medical profession, it's up to the professionals, it's up to the organisations to put these safety measures in place do they not have a chaperone system now sophie uh i don't know about gp practices i'm talking about the sexual health clinics that i worked in um and that may have been down to the nature of the conversations that were taking place as well so i'm a huge advocate um because i've seen it protect children because they are aren't able to go to their parents to talk about things that they're concerned about in terms of their sexual health they can go and talk to a trained clinician right but i see your point about the the flip side of that coin are we are they then putting themselves in a vulnerable position with somebody who might be an abuser i but think for me it's not i'm oh, sorry go on Jen. no i was just about to pick up on your point that um you know we have appropriate adults that must be in a police interview for any youth who is um being interviewed for a crime so it's about going back to isn't it about a structure and a policy yes i'm with you um sophie i also have worked in sexual health and actually i think it creates a very unsafe world if we don't allow young people to seek safety if sexual activity is happening there's obviously a balance in that but for me my head's immediately gone surely it's simple there has to be an appropriate adult no Mm. matter what it doesn't have to be a parent but there has to be an appropriate adult within that environment and that room as we afford young people who are going through the criminal system And actually, isn't why isn't there already? There must be one. I'm having a look now, but um, there should be. Surely that should be a, a process now because um, you know that that 14 year old is still a child as well, right? So yes, give them their voice, but they are still a child and they still need looking after. Uh, so I find this, Chris, join in on this conversation. I find this so uh, such a com- complex conversation because yes it's yes it's I see it's a very good thing for young people to have that space as long as they've got that chaperone there if they haven't then I have other issues around that Chris 
absolutely. And I think that was one of the recommendations from the um, ICSA in their earlier investigations when they looked at the medical profession is that the chaperone system must be in effect for the younger um children or the young person um, to protect them because obviously if they've gone to the medical profession because of a vulnerability to abuse say in the family home for example or um, in an organized network kind of way that they're being abused within the community um, having that um, safe place to go to is imperative and if they go to that safe space in, within the medical profession and that medical professional may feel that, oh, this child is vulnerable to abuse, if they are a perpetrator, then that is where the abuse can take hold as well. So having that chaperone or that um, adult responsible for those young people is an absolutely 100% essential thing to have. Thank you, Chris. So uh, not only is my pen active, I've now got out the highlighter and uh, my papers are now covered in uh, a, a luminous yellow um, with so much stuff and so much stuff that obviously you do think about. Well, when you look at it together, it's a really, really, it's a great big booklet, isn't it? <laughs> that we should have more of. You know, we talk about the medical training, reporting mechanisms. What what does that mean? Where do you go? Who do you report to? Who do you trust? When you're looking at people of power, um, and and you know, how do you then go around reporting because they are of a, a, a person in power? What should we be doing? Really looking at that acceptable language in the workplace, in all institutions, actually. Let's not just call the medical profession out here. Let's call all institutions acceptable language. A booklet, what's going to happen to me for, for children all the way through to adults? I'd like to know, like Chris said, she would like to know. She wants consideration and permission when she's going into any procedure. Uh, who knew that that was a thing, right? We just go into the doctors and we trust them. We do what we're told. We go jump on the bed. We we strip down from our waist or we strip down for a white. But actually... Uh, we need to know more. We need to question more. Um, you know, chaperoning. For me, that's a no brainer. That, that should be a chaperone in place because of this conversation as well, because it's not just protecting the child, but it's protecting um, the professional as well. So they have um, be, you know, if they are of a um, they're not an abuser, why wouldn't they want that uh, chaperone with them as well? Right. So um there's a whole heap of stuff that can be done here. I'm going to leave that for you to do, Sophie, because uh, obviously you're not busy enough. Uh, but I'm sure there's lots of things you can build in then. Look, this conversation can run and run and run and run. I'm always get, I always get very charged up. One word that Sophie resonates with is collaboration, which is, of course, all of us here. We want to collaborate. She talks about the change. There are a wealth of people that are working in this field to prevent sexual abuse and harmful sexual behaviours in children and young people. Sometimes it can feel like you are swimming against the tide, which is already what she said. But there are a great deal of people behind you working to combat this issue. We need more. We need more people. We need more, you know, we need more people to get behind, to challenge these conversations. We need young people to know that when they get to the doctors, if there's no chaperone there, they can ask that, where's my chaperone today? If you're going in procedure, you're not sure, ask what the procedure is. Why are you taking my gown off? What are you doing now? Why do I need to be on the bed stripped down from the waist? You know, lots of questions that need to be happening and they're not happening. And if there is and you are worried about a case of child sex abuse in the medical profession, uh, what is your reporting mechanism? What do you do to report that? OK, Denny, before we find, finally end today's show, which... Uh, uh, you know, I'm going to uh, hand over to you to do a summary. Thank you. OK, what a, what a multifaceted conversation we've just had. But I think it's from the top. It has to come from the top, doesn't it? If it's not coming from the top, all of us below trying to get this work out there, trying to get the message out there, we're always going to be swimming against the tide. So I think it was really important when Sophie touched on the hierarchy of the medical profession, the misogyny, the harassment. Unless that's challenged, we continue to silence people, women in particular. And um, it brings around a culture of normalising abuse. So two pronged approach. We need to stop the abuse happening in the first place, i.e. reduce the factors that make the abuse possible. And we also have to understand and have a far more trauma informed practice for child sexual abuse survivors. Remember, we're often 
um, labelled medically as histrionic, hysterical patients, highly anxious. And that's often a fear of why people don't speak out. They may not have disclosed previous abuse. So there's a whole fear around being believed and not being kind of labelled as a difficult patient. So what we know is that child sexual abuse survivors need to feel safe. They need to trust. They need to have choice. They need to have a collaborative approach and they need to feel empowered because we feel unsafe. We mistrust. We have no choice. We're being done to. We feel helpless and we don't feel we've got any control. And when you look at the medical profession, even something as simple as a blood pressure cuff could actually replicate and trigger a trauma response of being grabbed during an attack or a sexual offence. And Chris, you touched on that earlier. So I think for me, it's two pronged. Let's look at how abuse is able to continue to happen and let's make it a far more trauma informed practice when we do walk in. Let people know when someone's going to enter the room. Why am I taking this um, piece of clothing off? If I'm going to touch you, I will ask you if that's OK. I will seek permission. There's so many simple, easy um, approaches that we can do. Brilliant. Thank you, Denny. Um, OK, so look, we are coming to the end of today's show. What a show it has been. Uh, thank you to Denny, to Michael, to Chris, and also to Sophie. You can find um, all of my guests, to, uh, sorry, my guest today, Sophie, she's on Twitter, Dr. Sophie KH. That's Dr. Sophie KH. You can also find Denny um, on, oh, actually, your website, Denny. Have you got that live now? No, we're about two weeks away from that, but you can find me on Denny Corby Counseling on Facebook. Denny Corby Counselling on Facebook. You can find Chris on Twitter at Chris Tuck underscore WWHS. And Michael can go if you go to the www.thecasualpoet.com and myself, EJ the Mentor on Twitter. OK, look, we are trying to normalise difficult conversations. It's not easy to normalise difficult conversations, but you can really help if you're listening now. Um, maybe you are a survivor. Maybe you are an ally. Maybe you could share this because actually if you can share this conversation, it can help the, the children today and the survivors of the next generation to come. The more we engage, the more normal they do become. OK, uh, thank you to Johan at UK Health Radio, to all of uh, my panel and guests here today and to Christine and everyone else who is working hard behind the scenes to make this show happen. Thank you again. I look forward to seeing you next time. Goodbye. <laughs>